1 Samuel chapter 17. I want you to go with me there today. 1 Samuel 17, 37 says this. The same God. Come on and say same God. Mm, so good. The same God who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, okay, go on and God be with you. Father, thank you for your word today. As we open your word, may our hearts be open to receive our ears attentive to hear. And what you have sent your word to do today, God, let it be done. And I pray, Lord, that great courage would be given to those in this room, those who are viewing, those who are listening, God, who need your courage, supernatural courage. Let it come today as a result of your living word. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're in a series that I've entitled, Same God. Same God. And today, we're going to look at the life of David, one of my favorite Bible characters. Love the study of David. And the same God that was with David is with you. Think about that today. Let that thought Soak into your spirit. The same God that was with David out on the field tending sheep as a, a teenage shepherd is with you. The same God that was with David as he grew a little older and was not yet king but already been anointed to be king. He's in the waiting zone. Waiting. The anointing had come, but the appointing had not yet come. And he's waiting. And God was with him. The same God, listen to me today, the same God that was with David when he made some poor choices. Anybody ever made some poor choices? You don't have to raise your hand. You don't even have to nod your head. Because if you're breathing... You've made some poor choices. I've got some good news for you. I've got some hopeful news for you. The same God that was with David when he made not just poor choices, sinful choices. He's with me today. He's with you today. La Palma Christian Center, the same God is with us today. David is a fascinating carrier character, one of my favorite studies. He's got his fair share of ups and downs. He's got a life of twists and turns and highs and lows. Definitely not a perfect path. Maybe that's why I like to study him. Because my path is not perfect either. Your path is not perfect either. And just as David needed to rely on the courage that God would give, so do I and so do you. That's one of the standout characteristics, in my opinion, that marks the life of David. David found courage. Just when he needed it, God gave David courage. And as we study the life of David, we will see the Lord giving him courage all along his path. In various chapters of his life, God was there and God gave him what he needed. So this morning we are going to stop off at three different chapters of David's life and see what God did for him and what God could do for us today. We start here. God gave David courage in the conflict. I want you to take some notes today that I believe are going to help you. The Word of God is living and powerful. God has an assignment on it today. Jot down some thoughts that I believe are going to help you. 
courage in the conflict. You know, there's just some days that are filled with conflict. And you never know what day that's going to be. I think David got up just like any other day. He's going to do what he does. He's going to work. How many have a job? How many are thankful for the job that God has provided for you? How many want your boss to give you a raise? My wife raised her hand. (laughs) David's getting up and he's going to do what he does. What does David do? His assignment, he's the youngest of eight boys. His task, his job, tend to the sheep. Very important job. So here he goes. He's a shepherd for his father's sheep. But this particular day, his dad pulls him off. Maybe he has one of the hired hands. Watch the sheep. I've got something else that I want you to do. I want you to go check on your three oldest brothers. The three oldest brothers decided they were going to go to war with Saul. And dad, Jesse... He wants to make sure the the three oldest boys are okay. I want you to go check on them, and I want you to bring a report back. Since you're going, here's some cheese and crackers. Here's some lunch. I want you to take lunch to them, and also to the the captains, to the the, uh, officers there. So what does David do? He does what his dad asked him to do. And when he arrives, David sees and hears Goliath this Philistine. And he is boasting about everything that he can do and everything that he is. And he's also ridiculing God's people. This does not set well with David at all. He's taunting Saul. He's taunting Saul's army. So David says, why doesn't somebody go go out and, and fight this guy? Shut this giant up. And they're all afraid. They're all afraid. So David volunteers to go and fight for himself. Fight this giant himself. The king says to him, well, you're not fit for battle. Here, at least try on my my armor. After convincing Saul that he was capable after trying on Saul's armor and then taking it back off. David, a teenage boy, used to tending sheep, he goes out to face Goliath. And what does he take with him? The Bible tells us he took his staff, a sling, and five stones. Let's look what happened. Pick it up at verse 44. Chapter 17, the Philistine said to David, Come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beast of the field. Who are you anyway? And David says to him, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And just so you know, this very day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down, and I'm going to cut off your head. Woo! Now, he doesn't even have a sword in his hand. He has a staff a sling, and five stones. This very day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. I will strike you down and I will cut off your head and I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is in fact a God in Israel. And that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves, not with a sword, not with a spear. For the battle, listen to this, La Palma Christian Center, the battle is the Lord's. And he will give you into our hand. 
When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand into his bag and took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and struck the Philistine down and killed him dead. There was no sword in the hand of David. Get this today. Look at what God can use. God asked Moses, what is in your hand? And Moses simply had his walking stick. He had a rod. He had his staff. And God used it for his purpose. God used it for his glory. Now here we see God doing the same thing, using something simple, but anointing it to defeat the enemy. There was no sword in the hand of David. Pick it up at verse number 51. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his own sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed Goliath and cut off his head with his own sword. Is this getting to anybody today? Does this excite anybody today? And when the Philistines saw that their champion, the great Goliath, was dead, they fled. David bravely and courageously faced the giant and defeated the giant. But was David born brave? I don't think so. Did he naturally possess courage? Probably not. No, I believe that previous conflicts produced courage. That's not on your screen, but it's worth writing down. Previous conflicts produced courage. How many have ever had a previous conflict? <laughs> of course you have. Was God with you in a previous conflict? Well, he's the same God for you. And if God has produced courage for you in the past, he'll produce courage for you today. Fresh courage. Fresh mercy. New strength. Hallelujah. Previous conflicts produce courage. Let me go back to our text. Verse 37. Bring that up for me again. The same God. See, he's trying in this particular conversation, this particular text that I've used as the springboard and, and, and for the text of our message today, David is having this conversation with King Saul. King Saul says, there's no way I'm sending you out to face this giant. You're not, you don't even have armor. You're too young. You're too scrawny. You're too handsome, you know, all these things that are listed. There's no way. So David is trying to convince the king of what God has done for, for him before and, and telling him that he's the same God. The same God who rescued me from the paw of the lion. David faced real danger and real conflict previously. A lion is coming for the sheep. And instead of running, David faces that enemy and successfully defeats the lion. He goes on to say that on some occasion he also faced a bear. Now this is crazy to me because if I see a lion coming at me, if I see a bear coming at me, come on somebody, I'm out of here. You can have these sheep. I don't know, I'm just, I, what's David do? He trusts God. He trusts God in the conflict. It's, it's so many people want to just bail. It's too hard. It's too difficult. It's too painful. But don't give up in the, in the painful period. God's courage is coming to you. Has he not helped you in previous conflicts? Anybody want to just wave their hand as a testimony? God's helped me before. 
There you go, Joyce. Yes, he has. Yes, he has. Won't he do it again? Won't he give it again? Every conflict is a test of your trust. Every conflict that we go through is a test. Will we throw in the towel this time? Or will we hold fast to that unchanging hand? He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll be with you always. Even in the conflict. Every conflict is a test of our trust. I may not face Goliath, but I've got my own giants. We're doing a song. We did it several last week and I think the week before. We'll probably do it next week. It's called Same God. That's one of the lines in it. I might not face Goliath, but I do have my own giants. Well, every time a giant stands in your way, Every time a lion roars at you, every time a bear growls at you, every time you find yourself in the midst of a conflict, know that your faith is being tested, your trust in God is being tested, but just as God gave this youngest son of Jesse courage to face his giant, I believe God will also give you the courage you need to face your giant and to face your enemy. Thank you, Lord. Because that's what God does. God gives courage in the conflict. He'll give us the courage. We'd like the conflict just to go away. We'd rather avoid the conflict. But as I read my Bible, and as I look through history, and even as I just glance at my own life, I realize that's not how it works. He doesn't make the conflict go away. He just gives us the strength that we need. And he gives us the courage that we need. Remember what David said to the enemy. And I think what he said to himself. Verse 47. The battle belongs to the Lord. The battle is not mine. The battle is not yours. The battle belongs to the Lord. Let me take you to another chapter of David's life. It's not very long after he brings down the giant that he's being pursued. Number two, we see God giving David courage in the chase. David is celebrated, let me tell you. No one would go and face the giant. No one would go and stand before Goliath. David says, let me go. Come on, I'm ready. You can have this armor. It doesn't even fit me. Let me stay with what I know. And he, go, he goes and selects those five stones and got, just took one. The, he is celebrated. I mean, the ladies especially are celebrating David. The Bible describes him as handsome. And now he's a, a warrior, a victorious warrior. David, the women sang and danced, Saul has slain his thousands, David his tens of thousands. Well, Saul wasn't very happy about it. He's angry with David. The Bible describes he was angry with David. The Bible says he was afraid of David. And he began to resent him. Saul begins to pursue David. He's literally chasing him down in order to kill him. The Bible tells us that on two different occasions, David dodged a spear that Saul threw at him, trying to pin him to the wall, and he had been summoned by Saul to play a harp, to play an instrument. Because when David did this, David was anointed and an evil spirit 
A depressing spirit would leave the room and it would lift off of Saul. So he would, he would summon for David from time to time. But two different times, he had called for David to do this. David is doing this and he thro throws a spear trying to kill him. Saul organized search parties to go and find David and bring him back so he could kill him. And even when David had the opportunity to kill Saul, still he refuses. Even though he's being wrongly pursued, wrongly accused, God's giving him courage in the chase. Watch this. Listen to this. Pick it up at chapter 24 of 1 Samuel, verse 1. When Saul returned from following the Philistines, he was told, Behold, David is in the wilderness, wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men. Get this. Took 3,000 men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men in front of the wild goat's rocks. And he came to the sheepfolds by the way where there was a cave. And Saul went into the cave to use the restroom. Well, it happens. Went in to relieve himself. And David and his men were actually sitting in the innermost parts of the cave where it was dark, so dark, Saul couldn't see them. And the men of David said to him, here's your chance. God has given this to you. Here is the day which the Lord... See, they, they thought this was the Lord's doing. Behold, I will give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. What does David do? David got up, snuck close enough to Saul to cut off a corner of Saul's robe while he's using the restroom. Crazy. Afterward, David's heart struck him because he had done this. David felt convicted and he didn't even raise a sword to kill Saul. Even the, the little bit that he did, David felt convicted. Church, where's the conviction? Has the Holy Spirit changed? Where's the conviction? Well, I'll preach that another Sunday. You're not ready for that, it seems. Afterward, David's heart was struck because he had cut off the corner of Saul's robe. And so David says to his men, God forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord. What? To the Lord's anointed. God forbid that I should lay my hand on him because, like it or not, he is the anointed of the Lord. David went on and rebuked his men. Sharply rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. Restrained, listen to me, he restrained himself and he restrained his men. And so Saul left and went on his way. David displayed amazing courage in the midst of a chase. So what do we do today, church, when we are being chased? What do we do when we are being falsely accused, wrongly pursued? We wait for the same God that gave David courage to give us courage. Courage to exercise restraint. It takes courage to exercise restraint. Because let's face it. We want to take matters into our own hand. It takes courage to wait upon the Lord. 
Butler and the worship team led us in an anointed chorus this morning. He's in the waiting. But we want things right now. We don't want to wait. And we want to help God out. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody want to help God out from time to time? You think He's moving too slowly? You think He's going in the wrong direction? Come on, church. Don't leave me out here on this limb all by myself. It takes courage to exercise restraint. It takes courage not to retaliate. You got me, I'm going to get you. Our human nature is to get even, to get revenge and help God out. But even when David had the opportunity and the just cause, he still would not retaliate. He left the battle in the Lord's hands because the battle does not belong to me. The battle does not belong to you. The battle still belongs to God. Let God fight the battle. You don't even have to go and get a sword. Watch what God will do when we leave the battle in His hands. He'll give you courage. That's what He'll do. Just like He did with David. Let me take you to another chapter of David's life. Years have gone on. He is now the king. Courage and the consequences. Let me talk to you just as I close this message out in the next few minutes. Courage and the consequences. This may be the most important takeaway for you today. Later in David's life, we see him making some sinful choices with serious consequences. You see, when David should have been leading in the battle and on the battlefield with his men, the Bible tells us he stayed home. If you're tracking with me in your Bible, we're now in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse number 1. It won't be on the screen, but I want you to see it for yourself. When he should have been out with the soldiers, with the army, he should have been leading the way. The Bible says he was home. Ah, there's a sermon right there that I don't have the time to preach to you today. But look what happens when he's not where he's supposed to be at the right time. See, it's important that we are where God wants us to be when God wants us to be there. Had David been out on the battlefield with his men, he would not have been up on a roof on an evening and happened to see a naked woman across the way taking a bath. He would never have seen it because he would have been where God wanted him to be, where he was supposed to be. But he's up on the roof, the Bible tells us. He looks across the way. And there's Bathsheba. He keeps making really bad choices here. See, that's what happens. It's like a snowball. And he lingers too long. And he lets lust percolate and bubble up in his heart and his mind. And he's staring and he's lusting. He says, I gotta have that. Who is that? He even finds out she's married. One of, one of David's top soldiers, Uriah. That's Uriah's wife. Well, Uriah's out on the battlefield. So why don't you go and get her? And he sends for Bathsheba. And he sleeps with her. Well, he has sex with her. Another sinful choice, not just a bad choice. We're talking about a series of sinful choices. 
that led to serious consequences. He inquires of her, even after knowing she's a married woman, he sins for her, he sleeps with her, he has sex with her, sends her back home. It's all good now. That's what he thought. This encounter, this one time encounter, she got pregnant. Now I'm really in a fix, David says. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help God out. I can get out of this. He's the king. If I want a woman that's already married to somebody, I'm the king. I'm the king. I can get out of this. Send Uriah home. So he sends for Uriah. I'll just say I want him to update me on how the battle's going. So he sends for Uriah. Tell me how the battle's going, Uriah. And so Uriah gives this wonderful report. And David says, why don't you just go home and have a good meal with your, with your wife, with your family. And, you know, the unspoken. He's been on the battlefield, so when he's home, he's not just going to have a meal. He's going to be with his wife. David's got it all figured out. Uriah's going to sleep with his wife. She turns up pregnant, of course. He was with his wife. But little did David know the integrity of Uriah. And Uriah sleeps on the porch. He sleeps outside. He won't even sleep in his, in his home, let alone sleep with his wife. David's got one more shot before he sends him back out to the battlefield. So the next night, he tries to get Uriah drunk. This ought to do it. Because when you're drunk, well, I, yeah, I'll go on. Didn't work. Uriah still refused to lay with his woman, with his wife. He said, you know, how could I do that when all of my men, you know, Uriah had men under him. All my men, they don't get this opportunity. I refuse to do it. What a man of integrity. I want to meet Uriah. So David has to go to plan C or whatever it is at this point. Another sinful choice is made by the king of Israel. He says, send Uriah back to the hottest part of the battle and send him to the front line of it, knowing that this was certain death. And in fact, Uriah was killed. Now David is free to marry Bathsheba, problem solved. But there are serious consequences for sinful choices. God sends Nathan the prophet to deliver the consequences to David. Let me read this for you. The Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city. One was rich. The other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little lamb, which he had bought. And he brought it up, it grew up with him, with his children. He used to eat of the, the morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him. So he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come, come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, you are that man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you as king over Israel and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul and I gave your master's house and your master's wives into your arms and gave you the house of Israel and of all of Judah. And if this were too little, I would add to you even more. 
Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. And now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. I will do it openly. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin. You, therefore, shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you from Bathsheba will certainly die. These are serious, serious consequences. The sword shall never depart from your house. Evil will rise and come forth. From your house, I will give your wives to your neighbors. And this child that was conceived in sin will die. There are some lessons for us today. Lesson number one. Sinful choices produce serious consequences. Don't ever think God will wink at sin because he doesn't. The law of sowing and reaping will always be the law of sowing and reaping. Whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. If you sin, there is a price to pay. And if you continue in sin, it will ultimately lead to to death because the wages of sin is what? Romans 6.23, the payday for sin. That is a life of continuing in sin. If you sin and you repent, if you sin and you ask God to forgive you, He is kind enough, He is gracious enough to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. But sadly, for many, they will not confess their sin. They continue a life of sin and this will lead to death. Consequence. Sinful choices produce serious consequences. Lesson number two don't kick against the consequence. Super important for us today, church. People get mad at God because they're they're in their season of consequence. People turn from God in their season of consequence. Don't kick against the consequence. There's a season of consequence. But it is just that. It is a season. If you want roses to start growing, stop sowing stinkweed seeds. You got to break the cycle. Don't go out to your garden hoping for something that you never planted. Don't kick against the consequence. Don't get mad at God. Don't pull away from God. God didn't make you sin. We sin because of our own lust and our own desires. So man up and take it. It won't last forever. Get through your season of consequence. And as you do, stay humble, stay repentant. David, immediately, when Nathan 
busted his chops. He said, guess what, king? You are that guy. This man that I'm talking about, that you're so angry about, it's you. David could have, this could have gone a hundred ways that are wrong and only one way that was right. David humbled himself and confessed his sin to the man of God and to God himself. David said to Nathan, verse number 13, I've sinned. Confess your sin. We're not in that perfect state yet, are we? We're not in a glorified place yet, folks. The simple truth is we're all prone to still mess up. It's not giving us cause. I'm just telling you the truth. If you do, confess it. David owned it and he confessed it. And what does Nathan say to him? Well, the Lord is forgiving you. Which again goes back to what I said a moment ago, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. We see it happening immediately. David said, I've sinned against the Lord. Nathan said, the Lord has forgiven you. Because that's how, that's how our God works. That's who our God is. He's very quick to forgive us of our sins and remove the guilt and remove the stain. Stay humble. Don't get prideful. Stay repentant. Repent. David continued to go to church. He continued to worship the Lord. Verses 19 and 20 of chapter 12 David noticed that his attendants were whispering among themselves and he realized the child was in fact dead, which is what God said one of the consequences would be. Is the child dead, he asked. Yes, they replied, he is dead. And after an appropriate time of grieving, David got up and he washed his face and put on some lotion and changed his clothes, and look what he did. He went to the house of God, and he worshiped God. It's so important that you keep worshiping God through the hard times, through the grieving process. We're still going to worship him, aren't we, Snowdy? We're still going to give God thanks. It's so important. ate, took water, took food. I like what he says in Psalm 139. These are the words of David. Search me, God. Know my heart. Test me. Know my anxious thoughts. And see if there's any offensive way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. God gave David, courage in a season of consequence. And he's the same God today. So allow him. Allow the Lord to give you the courage needed in your season. Because it's going to take courage to walk through the season of consequence. Many turn away. Many give up on God, but not you. But you're going to walk through it with courage, courageously. And if we can hold on and endure in the season of consequences, a new season begins, and it's a season of life. As I close this message, I want you to see this new season starting for David. 2 Samuel 12, 24. So David comforted his wife Bathsheba, and he went in to her and made love to her again. And she gave birth to another son. They named him Solomon. And the Lord
Lord loves you. New season. In the book of Acts, David is remembered as a man after God's own heart. Those who have been joining us, viewing, listening remotely, good to have you with us. We long for the day when you'll be in the house with us. But for now, may the Lord bless you. We hope to see you.